Hey, what a great passage, isn't it? I'm going to, uh, I've got the privilege of, uh, of just being able to choose, pick and choose the questions that I answer, whereas you guys have got to do the whole lot. I am actually going to focus on question 3B. Okay, that's it. We're not going to, I'm not going to do anything other than 3B. So if you're hoping for a, a complete exegesis of the three chapters, you should ask for your money back. Always, 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 when we come to Scripture, what's the first thing we've got to do? What's the first question we've got to ask ourselves? What we've got to look for? I talk about this almost every time I talk about the Bible or come. What's the key thing that we've got to look at? What God's saying to us? What God's saying to us? Yeah. Context. The context. Okay. The context. You've got to look at the context. Uh, and the context for um, the whole of Scripture is that God is trying to reveal stuff about Himself. And what's the highest thing that God reveals about Himself? That He is love. love. Okay. God wants to be in a loving relationship with us. We've been created to be recipients, objects of His love. That's why we're here keep banging on about this because it's actually counterintuitive. It's not what we intuitively or instinctively think about. We think it's about service. We think it's about doing stuff. Um, one of our elders preached the other day, didn't she, and said, uh, you know, God didn't create us as human doings, but as human yeah. beings. And uh, we need to keep taking that. So we're created to be recipients of God's eternal, infinite, and unconditional love. It's not, therefore, about dictatorship. It's not about kingship. It's primarily about relationship. relationship. He knew there'd be ships all the way through it. It's good. No, so, hard, no hardships. No hardships, <laughs> but relationships. <laughs> and hopefully for lunch we get some fishing. <laughs> okay. That's the point. It's all about relationship. All about relationship. So when Israel was called into being, why were they called into being? To demonstrate to a world that thought relationship with any sort of God was based on sacrifice, was based on law, was based on doing stuff, was based on who you were or what you did. God called out Israel in order to demonstrate that actually God is a God of love who is passionately committed to relationship. And they were to be distinctive and to show that relationship so that all the other nations would understand it and would get it, would see it. A work example. That's the point, isn't it? It's not that God looked down and saw that, that, that the people who would become the nation of Israel were better than, or were working harder than, or understood more than. It's simply that he chose to call them out of all the rest of the peoples and say, you know what, I'm going to uniquely reveal myself to you, not because you are exclusively good, but because in the midst of that relationship, all the other nations will see it. So he says to Abraham, get up, leave here, go there, on the journey you'll discover about me, and through that discovery, through that relationship, the nation that you will become will be a blessing to everybody else. But at the point that we're in, in 1 Samuel, what have the people said? We don't want to be distinctive. We don't want to be different. We want to be like the other nations. We don't want to be those people who are influencing other nations to be in relationship with you. We want to be like those other nations, except of course we'd like to be a bit more powerful so that we can dominate and control and get our own way. And therefore, let all of that is summarised in the cry of the people, give us a king. Now then, what does love do in those circumstances? When it's faced with rebellion, when it's faced with the opposite of that which it knows is best, what does love do? 
loves. Loves? And how is that love expressed? Gives them a king. Gives them a king. You see, here's the deal. Love, says 1 Corinthians 13, does not insist on its own way. God is a God of almighty power. He could insist on his own way, couldn't he? Yeah. But because he's love, he chooses instead to release and allow. The world is all about control, it's about power, it's about hierarchy, not so the kingdom of God. Ephesians 5 says this, it says, In the light of all that Jesus is, rank yourself under him and under one another mutually. And then he gives a whole bunch of examples about that. Yeah? Con continue to consider others better than yourself. Continue to put yourself under one another. It's not about hierarchy, it's about humility. But the people cry out, give us a king. We don't want to be holy, distinctive, different. We want to be like everyone else. God is love. Love does not insist on its own way. God therefore gives them what they ask for. Now, there's a point in this. So often I hear people looking at the issue of guidance and they're wandering through their life and they get to a decision point. And they come and they say, you know, I've been praying about this and I haven't heard anything from God. I haven't heard, I don't know what God's saying about this. I don't know whether to go this way or that way. And so they get into this whole door knocking Thing. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to knock on some doors, and if it opens, I'll take that as a sign that it's right. Well, the people of Israel knocked on the door here, didn't they? They said, God, give us a king, give us a king, give us a king, knock, 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 give us a king. God gives them a king. Was that best? Yeah. Was it what God wanted for them? Yeah. No. Would it lead to the disaster that God had said it would? Yeah. Absolutely. Please, please, please. Don't let's be those people who knock on doors until they actually fall off their hinges and then presume that we have now got God's will. Okay? Because actually, the reason for silence sometimes is that God has already spoken. God had already told them clearly what the plan was. He had already told them clearly the way ahead. There was no, nothing further to say. Sometimes there's silence because actually there's nothing more to say. Mm. Not because there's nothing to be said. You get that? Mm. It's not that there's nothing to be said on this issue. It's that God has already said all he needs to say. And what we need to do is to be obedient to what's been said. Not to keep knocking on the door that we actually want to go through. And are hoping that God is going to uh, kind of authorise what we have already decided to do. Does that make sense to you? So let's, let's please be, just be careful of that. So that's the context. Okay, we do have an hour and a half, don't we? Okay, that's the context. The next thing is 3B. The question 3B says, how did Saul get himself in this mess? How did he get to the point where he was so off beam? How, how did he end up in this place? And that's what I want to look at. And the next thing I think that we need to do is to look for the origin of our vulnerability. We, if we're wise... We know, under God, and because of the friends that we have, what makes us vulnerable, or what areas we're vulnerable in. We go around and we can perhaps share some of those areas of vulnerability. We, we just know that we're weak in those areas. It's not that, that um, we don't have a choice, but we just know we're vulnerable in those areas. What's the origin of that vulnerability? Well, the reality is that Saul trusts in his accomplishments for his job security, doesn't he? God called him to be king. God called him. He had the call of God on his life. He had the anointing of God on his life. He had all the stuff that he needed to do the job that God had called him to do. There was no prediction of failure in the sense that he didn't have any choices. Saul could have chosen rightly and have been the best king that it was possible to be. Yeah. It wasn't part of God's eternal plan that Saul should screw up. It wasn't predetermined that he should make a mess of things. But he chose. But what was it that made him vulnerable? Well, as soon, you know, he thought 
that whilst he was good looking, handsome, you know, quite me, and strong, and all of those kind of things, um, that he was fine. As long as he looked the part of being a king, that God would keep him as king. And therefore, whilst he was killing and slaying the thousands of enemies, it was all right. He didn't trust in the call and the anointing of God. He trusted in his ability to fulfill what God had called him to do. Yeah. Boy, you're in trouble when you do that, aren't you? You know, hey, leading a church like this is such a phenomenal privilege, and you never think that, that allows me to sleep at night. It's not my job. It's not my job. It's not my job to build the church. Who's going to build the church? Jesus is going to build this church. I can, I can do stuff that I hope participates in that process. But it's his responsibility. Yeah? And therefore, we need to identify the area of vulnerability. And then we need to deal with them. We'll come back to dealing with it in just a few minutes' time, I hope. So, it's about choices. Okay? The first choice um, that we come across is in 1 Samuel 19. And verses 4 to 6. Did I have choice this morning to come here or not? Yes. I did, didn't I? Um, was it a free choice in the sense that there were, you know, it was a little choice floating in a vacuum up here? No, it was a choice that had lots of influences on it. Yeah? So it's, it's a free choice, but it's not free will in the sense of not having any things impinging on it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So just chat out some of the things that, that might have influenced my decision as to whether to stand before you this morning. Well, you're waiting, you? <laughs> yeah, you're waiting. So there's a, there's a sense of duty of responsibility. I said I'd do it and mm -hmm. therefore there's an expectation. So that's an influence. What, what else? God has something to say through you to us. Okay, I trust that that's the case. That, you know, this is part of the calling on my life, is to teach, and therefore it's a fulfilment of that. So that's possible. What about some negative things? Ill health. Oh, okay, so I've got Sarah at home, who's recovering from her tonsils being lasered out and stuff like that. So, you know, you might want to do something. You get the point. Mm -hmm. On any choice, there are influences in either direction. But here's what God says. He says, there'll be no negative influences on you that are so powerful that you are unable to make a godly choice. He says, with every temptation, there is a way of escape. Other way around. When the enemy is pressing, he says, a bruised reed, I will not allow to be broken. In other words, God puts boundaries around the extent to which we can be influenced. And he will only allow us to be influenced within our capacity to make a godly moral choice. Okay? The great, that's great news. The bad news is it leaves us without any excuse. Doesn't it? Because mm -hmm. actually we could have chosen other than that which we did. Okay? Now there's a slight twist on that that we'll get to in just a few moments. So here we are. Here's an influence, a godly influence in Saul's life. Jonathan, his son, speaks well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Let not the king wrong to, do wrong to his servant David. He has not wronged you, and what he has done has benefited you greatly. He took his life in his hands when he killed the Philistine. The Lord won a great victory for all Israel, and you saw it and were glad. Why then would you do wrong to an innocent man like David by killing him for no reason? Saul listened to Jonathan. He heard that godly influence and took an oath, as surely as the Lord lives, David will not be put to death. There's a positive, godly influence in his life, he hears it, and he responds to it. But then, just in a few verses uh, further down, verse 8, once more, war broke out. This is it's all the area of vulnerability, isn't it? Who's going to kill the most people? Who's going to get the most affirmation from the people? That's where he's putting his trust in. And David went out and fought the Philistines. He struck them with such force that they fled before him. How does Saul feel? Vulnerable. Threatened. And what does he do? So there's a negative influence 
The enemy comes along and uses the circumstances and influences him, worries him, makes him anxious. Oh, David's more popular than you. David's this, David's that. You're... You get the deal? Now, an evil spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he was sitting in the house. He had a spear in his hand while David was playing the harp. I don't think it was just because David wasn't playing his favourite tune here. I think it was that. <laughs> Saul tried to pin him to the wall with this. Yeah? And therefore, choice two, war and David's success, Saul feels honourable and that influences him and he responds by trying to kill David. Then choice three, here's what happens next. And I'm not going to read all of this because time doesn't permit, but chapter 19, 18 to 24, and then the story concludes in 20, 30 to 32. Here's the deal. Saul's in the midst of this, and he's wandering now, he's looking for um, Samuel, and the Spirit of God falls on Saul, and Saul begins to prophesy. Remember that part of the story? You know, what happens is we're in the midst of these choices, and we're making good choices sometimes, we're making bad choices other times. In the midst of that, so often, God will come and he will just shine a huge, big, bright, unambiguous light into that area of our life. And the Spirit of God comes, and it could be through other people, it could be through the Scriptures, it could be through circumstances, but suddenly, it's that highlighter pen through it, and you can't ignore it. You go, wow, yes, that's true, that's God's. Got God's authentic stamp on that. Now then. In the light of that, if you then choose against God, you make yourself extraordinarily vulnerable to the enemy. Okay. And in the light of this, what we see happen is Saul make decisions against David. There's this whole feast thing, and David goes away, and there's the arrows, and all of that that you've studied. And now Saul not only tries to kill David, but when Jonathan tries to defend him, he tries to kill his own son. That's what will happen. Because if we are in the midst of God's great light, either our eyes are opened to the light of God, or we are even more blinded to the things of God. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now what I want to do is, um, in, the, in the last um, uh, hour and a quarter, is just to... Um, just to go through this on, on here, I don't know how, quite how well this is going to work and so on, so we'll just take a risk, okay? Because I want to draw some things, and you know how good I am at drawing. Laugh. Okay. I'll just introduce this first of all by saying this. Righteousness, you can think of as right choice. Yes. The sequence of making right choices. Whereas making wrong choices, there isn't a word for that, wrong choiceness doesn't quite chip off the tongue, does it? But the shorthand for wrong choiceness is sin. Okay? That's what sin is, wrong choiceness. And uh, the first time we see wrong choiceness, sin, is in that garden, isn't it? The Garden of Eden. Yeah. And what happens there? God has said, God has already spoken all that he needs to speak. Don't do it, for in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Okay? And as Adam and Eve gave over that, the enemy of their souls received the authority that God had given them. And so just as a kind of shortcut, what I want to suggest is this. That when we make wrong choices, in the light of what the choice is that we should have made, something dies... And we empower the enemy against us. Okay? Some of you have heard me say this before. Yeah? When we sin, when we make wrong choices, something dies, and we empower the enemy against us. Okay? Now that's important, because here's what I think happens. Do, we need, do you want me to move this? Maybe yeah, it's fine. So here we are the choice. Okay? We can go God's way. We've got the enemy down here, and we've got godly choice across the top. Okay? There are different influences on those choices. Yeah? So when we want to choose, there's sort of choices that we have to make. 
The godly choices, the godly influences are things like we read the scriptures, we have a conscience, we have friends who give us advice, all of those kind of things. Yeah? You with me? In terms of going the enemy's way, we've got the, what does the Bible say? We've got the lust of the flesh, the lust of the world, and the pride of life. Those things kind of operate against us. And so we've got those influences. In any choice, we've got those influences. But we have the choice to make. All right? So that's the general case. Here's the specific. So, I can go this way, which is God's way, or I can go down the page, which is the enemy's way. And I'm going to suggest that here, the influences that go God's way and the enemy's way are about the same. They feel about the same. But we choose to go against God. Okay? It's a conscious choice. God in His grace brings us back round to the same choice at some point in the future. This time, what do you think the influences are going to feel like? Well, here's the process that often happens. We make this choice, and this time, we, the first time, we asked our friends, and our Christian friends said, don't do it. There's this Bible verse that came to mind, because we've been going to CBS, and we had a good idea of scripture. And it popped out, and it said, don't do it. And our conscience, the alarm bell went, ding, 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 don't do it. And we did it. <coughs> This time you come to the same choice. Are you going to talk to your friends about it? No. No, because they told you not to do it. Last time you did it anyway, you've been embarrassed. So now you don't have the accountability. So that doesn't sound very loud. This time you know that somewhere in Scripture there's a verse that talks about this, but you can't quite put your finger on it. And your conscience is a bit... But it's not as loud. Have you ever experienced that kind of thing? Yeah. This process? Mm -hmm. The influences to go God's way are less. They're still there, but they're less. This time, the influences to go against God are much stronger. You've still got a choice. It's still your choice. Now you come to that and again. This time, well, you don't have Christian friends this time because you stopped hanging out with them. You haven't read your Bible in weeks, and so you don't even think about that, and your conscience doesn't say anything at all. There's almost no influence this way. But this time, there's a huge influence to go against, and it's therefore easier to keep making wrong decisions. You, you understand this process? Okay. Here's the deal. The first few times that we make these kind of decisions, We actually have conscious choice. After a while though, we stop making choices actively in our mind. And what we end up doing, we still have choice, but what it is, it's become a habit. Does that make sense? Yeah. A habit is a decision that's made without a choosing process. Mm. You know that? A habit is a decision that's made without going through an active choosing process. And so you end up with a habit. Now then, just as we saw, at some point, God shines this huge, big light into that area of your life. Because it's gracious. That's what he does. Yeah? Now then, in that light, if we then choose to go against God, what happens? Remember, when we make wrong choices, what happens? Something dies and we empower the enemy against us. What happens at this point is that we establish, we enable a stronghold into our life. <coughs> what Simon describes it as this evil spirit. Mm -hmm. yeah? yeah? But what it is, we have died, we have died to the right to choose in that area of our life. We've given it up. Yeah? And there's a stronghold, and now although there's a theoretical choice to go God's way, actually we have given over control of that area of our life to the enemy. 
that we're locked in. We're dead in that area of our life. Some of you may have areas of your life where this is true. Where over the years, that's just, and you can't get rid of it. You can't, it just seems like you can't change the pattern in that area of your life. Well, in the last uh, five minutes, I want to give you some good news. Okay? Is that the end of the story? No. Yeah. no. Was it the end of the story for Saul? Did it have to be? No, no it didn't. It didn't. Yeah. But he would persist in that and wouldn't seek any help in it. There's two words that allow us to change this. The first one is confession. Confession simply means to say the same as. To say the same as God about this. You see, what happens when we make those wrong choices is that the enemy lies and we buy the lie that this is okay. That this is alright. That it's not really a problem. We buy that lie. It's what everybody else does. It's what the world does. It's okay. We move away from biblical standards to the world standards. We have our mind conform to the way of this world instead of being transformed into the way of the kingdom. And therefore confession is the first step in this process. Because what it is, it's getting down before God with his word, with his people and saying, God, how do you see this? Lust is not simply something that happens in my head and doesn't affect anybody. When we get before God, we understand that instead of it being like that, actually it's me devaluing somebody else who Christ died for, and instead of there being an unconditionally loving relationship there, it's a relationship based on what I can get, or what I imagine I can get. And it's no longer something that's innocent in my head, it's killing somebody. Do you get that? Mm. Now then, when I see it from that perspective, when I see it from God's perspective, what it does is it leads to repentance. Repentance isn't being sorry that you got caught. Repentance isn't so being sorry for the consequences of your wrong action. Both of those may be healthy things, but it's not repentance. Repentance is the result of seeing it from God's perspective, because repentance means to change your mind. It leads to a different way of seeing it. I used to think this was alright, now I know it isn't. Doesn't mean that I can't still do it, but if I now do it, I know I'm doing it, and it's wrong. It's breaking, it's breaking relationship with God. It's a much bigger hurdle. Okay. So confession leads to repentance. Repentance leads to our mind being renewed. renewed. And that gives the option for new life. One of the basic things that Christians need to be involved in is healing the sick, preaching good news to the poor, visiting the widows and the orphans and those in prison, and raising the dead. Okay? Well, hey, you may not yet have faith for physically raising somebody who is physically dead, but we can all start here, can't we? Can't we all start by praying for people to see them, the wonderful new life that God has for them restored in some of these areas, and maybe in our own as well? Wouldn't that be good? That's what we're called to. We need to understand this. So we get new life. Okay. And then finally. Here's the reverse pattern. We started out dead in an area of our life. And now, wonderfully, we've been raised to new life in that area of our life. Now we have genuine choice and genuine power again to make those choices. Now, reverse it. If this way now is the enemy, and this way is God, as I make a godly choice, 
Guess what happens? The influences change. So the influence to go God's way increases, and the influence to go the enemy's way decreases. And we keep making those governments. At some point, I'll tell you what will happen, the enemy will come along and he will give you a huge test of area of your life. Yeah? And if in that, that big test, you continue to make godly choices, do you know what? Instead of building a stronghold, you build the lordship of Christ in that area of your life. You genuinely make him Lord. It's not an empty word anyway. Jesus be Lord. Well, Jesus being Lord is because you choose to make him Lord. He will not impose it because love does not insist on its own way. This is how we genuinely make Jesus Lord in this area of our life. And we hand over to him the right to make right choices for us in this area of our life. It's not a one-off thing. It's a process in the light or the darkness of the enemy's testing. And that process is not a process that leads to death. It's a process that leads to life and is called sanctification. Okay? Is that useful, helpful? You guys need to go away, not right this second, but in a few minutes, and just prayerfully ask God, are there areas of my life where I've become my soul? Are there areas where I have handed things over to the enemy and I'm dead in that area? Get alongside somebody you trust and pray and see this process of confession and repentance lead to new life in that area of your life. Where there's already life in that area, make sure you're making godly choices so that those get sealed and fixed into a godly pattern. Does that help with some of those things? Love doesn't insist on its own way. It's all about him giving you the choice to make it so. Let me pray. Father, we want to give you great thanks that you love us like this. Lord, what a responsibility we have there, not to ask for the wrong things. What a responsibility we have to hear you and then get on and do it. What a joy that we are created to be recipients of your unconditional love. Father, would you help us just swim in that? Just bask and bathe in the joy of it. But then to take the responsibility that goes with it. To make godly choices. And to see that life established and rooted and grounded and flooding through us. That we might demonstrate to others the truth of your wonderful word. Thank you Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.